For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamene. Joining me is former lawyer and UN diplomat Costa Ayotis to discuss his book titled My Big Fat Greek Taverna from Diplomacy to Ozo. Welcome, Mr. Ayotis, and thank you very much for making time. Thank you, Sane. Thanks for the opportunity. It's lovely to be here. So your book uh, follows what you call a moment of madness. Yes. When you, a former UN diplomat, quit Joburg yes. and you decided to open a great taverna in Cape Town. Yes. Tell us about that and why it yes. was a moment of madness for you. Well, I think it was, uh, I realized we, we wanted to start a family. We wanted to do something completely different, something radically different and sort of throw caution to the wind. So after the sentence, legal advising, you know, routine, mm. we thought, what can we do different and live in a better environment? And food has always been a part of our culture, a yeah. celebration with food and people. Mm. And I've, I had it as a young lawyer mm -hmm. where I thought there's got to be something more positive to make people happy with food than being a lawyer because nobody's happy with, with the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> we were doing death, divorce and mm. debt. Yeah. So that it was a whole journey, but eventually the timing, we looked at each other and said, let's get out of sand, let's get out of Joburg, mm. let's go to the coast. If we don't do it now, when are we going to do it? And that's, that's the decision. Mm. In the book, you also share your funny moments uh, during your days, as you've mentioned, yes. as a lawyer. Yes. You ended up not enjoying it because yes. you are telling us that it was actually your father's dream. Yes, it but was. But then there were moments where you were like happy, especially your visits to the Supreme Court. Can you briefly share yes. those? Yes, so uh, with my principal, I mean, my principals and the partners were very good to me. They mm. included me in some high level litigation, mm. uh, Barry Katz and others, that they were all really a great bunch of people mm. but I, there was just this negativity in law there's always a presumption of negativity whether you win or lose it's still uh, you know it, it, it's it's a unless you may be doing something very elevated like the late George Bezos doing mm. human rights law protecting the weak and the vulnerable general litigation is not very very uplifting a lot of the time but there were moments where I did enjoy it and it was always those moments when we'd break away and we'd go and have an omelette and we'd have coffee and we'd go to restaurants and cafes in between trials. Mm. Um, you know, you, you, you watch TV series like LA Law and others and you think, wow, this is glamorous. It's mm. not. Mm. Normally there's two people, the advocates on both sides, the attorney, the client and the judge mm. and the clerks. It's not a very, uh, unless it's a high profile murder thing. Mm -hmm. But we didn't do any of those, obviously. We had a commercial, mostly mm. commercial practice. Mm. What was interesting for me were your, your, your invitation, where you, you were invited by these women who had just divorced. <laughs> Tell us about those. Yes, so basically my job as a young uh, candidate attorney was to, from Kempton Park, where in the Trust Bank Center, where the office was on the 8th floor, every Wednesday was the row, 160 divorces on a Wednesday. So I would, in convoy, they would go in their cars, it was always the women, these were uncontested. Mm. So they'd plead irreconcilable differences, it was a quick divorce. Mm. We had the most modern divorce system in the world, you could just, I just don't like the, the look of him. <laughs> and the judge wanted to get through 160 wow, quick, so five minute, five minute, to go and play golf in the afternoon. <laughs> And then the ladies, of course, wanted to celebrate their newfound freedom. So then I'd invite me across the road to, um, to go and have uh, drinks with them and toast and champagne. And of course, I'll, I would then wait there and think, you know, I can get to the office a bit later. I don't mm. have to rush back to the office. Yeah. So I was included in their celebrations. <laughs> You also share a bit about your diplomat career, which yes. was also interesting, and you were also caught up in that historic moment on yes. 29 November 1990 yes. when Security Council voted on the famous resolution now yes. that is known as 678. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, so I arrived there when already, um, when I arrived there in August, I think August, September, the General Assembly was in session, but Saddam Hussein, Iraq, had invaded Kuwait. Mm. So that had already happened. There was that illegal, that invasion of Kuwait. Then the international community rallied with resolutions. Um, and I was just thrown, my ambassador said, listen, you're going to live, eat, sleep in the Security Council. I want to know at every minute what's going on. And if there's something important, you call me so that I can take the seat. Um, and so I was just thrown in, you know, this young boy from Kempton Park who used to ride his bicycle, study, I'm in this high powered world of diplomacy. And it was a very historic resolution to. Uh, to use all, ne all means necessary to expel Iraq, to get Iraq to, to get out of Kuwait. 
So that was a very, uh, that was definitely history being made. All the foreign ministers of all the, the 15 security members, security council members were there. So that was an incredible moment, uh, actually watching history being yeah. made. Mm. And you also share a few first, first few weeks um, in Manhattan with your wife now, Christine, which were also a bit of fun exploring the city. Yes. Yes. Tell us about that. Yes, so we were like wide-eyed children. We arrive at this big city. I mean, I've never had a big city, like a city like New York. Mm of course. Mm -hmm. Always read about it in these glamorous magazines, these apartments, high-rises, mm -hmm. Macy's, Bloomingdale's, the shopping, you know. It's, uh, so we arrived there and we just hit the streets walking. I remember the first weekend we bought the New York Times, but I didn't realize it's like a brick oh. this thick. It comes in two sections. It was, I mean, it would take you a week to read the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And we carried it around realizing <laughs> we can't carry this thing. This is it's just the book review is a newspaper. <laughs> anyway, so we're going to the delis, the fantastic delis, mm. and it's the world in one city. I mean, you've got so many cultures, so many cuisines, so much. Mm. It's, it's just, it attracts the, the best and the brightest of the world, really. It's almost, I would say, an international city. So we were, we were struck with wide-eyed wonder at this variety. I mean, like kids in a candy store, mm. uh, at how much was on offer. It was, it was a, your senses, you know. Mm. We're just uh, 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 taking it all in. You also share a, a bit of what you as now South Africans used to do just to remember the, the culture and what we were eating yes. in the country. Yes. So, of course, we served our very, very fine South African wines at our parties and that. And then, of course, being South Africans, I mean, we did cook babuati, mm -hmm. uh, our classic, classic sort of dish. And then, of course, there's everybody in South Africa loves uh, Buravos and Biltong. So we had this Biltong and Buravos club that had been long established and mm -hmm. as the newcomer somebody was leaving I bought in and then on a weekend we had mm -hmm. escaped to make Buravos and Biltong which we served at our cocktail parties wow. and then being a crazy South African of course I was brying illegally on a 47th floor tiny little balcony with my little smoky Joe because mm. the fire the fire detectors were in this apartment on the mm. 47th floor we had a tiny kitchen so every time you fried bacon or did air, you would set off the fire the fire alarm but on the balcony you didn't. And we had the fire brigade right down at the bottom, looking down at the bottom at these little little cars from the this high-rise building. Mm. So when I read about now uh, you pursuing this dream of opening a restaurant in Hout Bay, it was not smooth sailing at all because there were ups and downs, but then it gives one a lesson that nothing just comes like in a yes. silver platter. I'm sure yes. there were lessons learned. Yes, lots of lessons. Nothing is ever easy. And you have an idea of how it's going to go, but you get curveballs in life. Mm -hmm. And it's how you deal with them and with the challenges. Mm -hmm. From some of the locals who are in the village, you're going to drink, you know, old retired people that are quite negative, mm -hmm. saying this is never going to work, and you're in premises that are never going to work because mm -hmm. nothing ever worked here mm -hmm. in this old house we had the back door on the beach and we were newcomers we'd never done this sort of thing before and I mean you know the restaurant industry yeah. has a very high failure rate in the first year a lot of mm -hmm. people don't make it so there were those challenges um, but actually we were we were quite determined and we had energy and we were quite optimistic and we thought the only concern was well we're gonna open this place mm -hmm. but will they come I mean, you're going to open, you've never done this before, you throw caution to the winds and you have just take that leap of faith mm. and believe, hang on, the universe has got, just do it to the best of your ability, um, treat people, you know, as if they're in your home, mm. give them the best food. I mean, our prices were very reasonable. Uh, it was a warm welcome and, and people started flocking. We were, we were full house from day one. Wow. So mm. And then that food critic visited your, your place and yes. there were things that were not like going yes. as planned. Tell us about that. Yes, so those were the he challenge. was generous. Yes, the food critics were, uh, in fact, all of them were very generous mm. and understanding and very forgiving of our errors. <laughs> so we did make mistakes, mm. but you learn it. The great thing about the restaurant business, if you make a mistake on the day, you can fix it immediately. Mm. In the legal profession, you pick it up months later. Mm -hmm. So it's a very immediate business. Mm -hmm. But on that particular day, that was a curveball. That was something where suddenly your staff don't sh show up. You're short-staffed, mm -hmm. and you're short in the front and in the kitchen, the engine room. So what do you do? So I would normally be in the front greeting people. I had to go into the kitchen. So, But I, we had sort of drummed it into our waiters that you must serve drinks very quickly. And they took, because we were short staff, mm -hmm. this particular food critic got his wine very late. Mm -hmm. But then once he got his wine and he got the food and he tasted the food, I mean, everything was delayed there. It was the worst service 
it was the most stressful moment of my life more than being a lawyer a diplomat that particular day that mm. sunday wow. but he was graham how was his name and he was incredibly generous mm. about the food and very forgiving so i'm very very grateful i called him afterwards i said i'm so sorry we dropped the ball mm -hmm. it was just one of those days where mm. things were not going our way so we were always scared about sundays because mm. everybody used to arrive at the same time yeah. and then the kitchen was overwhelmed interesting so it's it's such a lovely book and i'm sure a lot of people if they read they could relate with some of the stories that you share so as we are now approaching the festive season and things winding down yes. what are you hoping readers will take away from your copy i think i set out to write a happy book i mean i, I had a very i had a fun time it was more fun writing the book than running the restaurant <laughs> So, but the, I must say, the majority of people in our restaurant came as customers and left as friends. Mm. So that we, we, the food business is there to make people happy, isn't it? And the book's the same. I was guided by the same spirit, mm -hmm. uh, uh, is to make people happy, to le put a smile. We, we live in a very complicated, challenging times, mm -hmm. both in our country, we have our challenges, and in the world. Mm. But the book would maybe also inspire them maybe to make a change in their life. If they want to do something crazy, something different, something they haven't done, we get stuck in convention and the routine, and we don't make those changes. So uh, take that leap of faith, take on whatever it is you want to do, and do it to the best of your ability. The journey is going to be the destination anyway. So different people get different things from it. Some see it motivational, some see it as a happy, fun, entertaining story. But uh, it would, most people feel happy after reading it. So for this Christmas season, um, as a stocking filler, or just to make people smile and, and make them feel happy, and maybe inspire them mm. uh, to do something to do something different if they want to mm. with their lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. Thank, thank you for the invitation. It's lovely to be here. Thank you so much. There was Costa Ayotis in conversation with Polity, discussing his book titled "My Big Fat Greek Taverna: From Diplomacy to Ozone."